Well, it's with great pleasure that I uh, welcome all of you to the Seabear uh, Virtual Seminar Series and uh, to get us started here today. Um, again, we'll get a, a couple minutes of, of, of announcements and then uh, introduce our speaker and, and go from there. So, um, Laura, if you'll move to the next slide, uh, we can you know, remind people again, you all know what Seabear is or probably you know, know of our work to, to bring insights from behavioral science to agro-environmental uh, programs and to work uh, with our federal agencies here in the United States uh, and around the world with partners, uh, local, um, big and small, to really talk about what we can use for behavioral insights and how this can improve contact with landowners, uh, persistence of, of practices, and uh, thinking of a variety of ways of, of making things better uh, for landowners and the land. So uh, we're excited uh, that we're here. I uh, want to talk, uh, just make sure what people do know about a new uh, call for papers uh, that, that's coming out. And uh, we have a, a special issue of food policy uh, that's been accepted. And, and so uh, we're excited that Paul and I are uh, co-editing this and um, looking at deadlines around the 31st of August. And so we welcome uh, papers, research papers, reviews, other things along that line. Uh, see the, the call for papers on the CBER website and you can learn more. Um, but again, it's a great opportunity and we're excited that the editors of uh, Food Policy have um, you know, opened this out for, for all of us to participate in. So Laura, I'm gonna pass it back on over to you to talk about some, uh, some housekeeping here. Um, and again, Absolutely. welcome. Thanks so much, Kent, and welcome everyone. I'm happy to see you all. So uh, as, as usual for our CBEAR seminars, we will, uh, keep, uh, everyone will remain muted during the seminar and we strongly encourage questions to be submitted via the chat. And then at the end of the seminar, we will have uh, Mark Masters will lead the sort of question and answer session using, using the questions you submit. So please, please use the chat function. And a quick uh, reminder to join us next time as well for our final seminar of this, this year's series, uh, which will be Kent Messer on April 4th. So to uh, introduce today's speaker, I'm really happy to have Dr. Hong Li Fung here, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Economics at Iowa State University. And uh, Dr. Fung is also the endowed professor for excellence in agricultural economics, and will be speaking today about uh, veterinarian antibiotics use and uh, information updates. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it off to you. Okay, does this uh, look right? Look right, does everybody see my screen? Absolutely, thanks so much. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, thanks Laura, thanks Kint. Um, it's, um, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to present. Um, I have attended, I think, almost all of the uh, uh, Bears seminars. It's always been very useful, very informative. So today I'm thrilled uh, to be here to, uh, to share my research. Um, the, um, the title for my uh, today's presentation is the World Tests Lead to More Informed Antibiotics Use, um, an Application in Veterinarian uh, Diagnostic Decisions. Uh, so this is joint work uh, with uh, Yalan Jia, um, who is the lead author. Yalan is a PhD student at uh, Michigan State University. Um, other collaborators include David Hennessy, uh, who is at the Department of Economics, also Iowa State University and uh, Angel Abelo. Um, Angel is a veterinarian um, at uh, Michigan State University. So, um, the, just a second. Um, antibiotic uh, resistance has attracted lots of attention. Uh, it's uh, frequently in headline news. So I just uh, uh, copied uh, a couple of uh, recent uh, quotes here. Uh, one is uh, from uh, Nax uh, Minerarium, and uh, he has uh, 
uh, called the antimicrobial resistance, the other pandemic. So it's just uh, uh, another pandemic that's uh, looming for humanity. And WHO's website calls it one of the biggest threats uh, to global health for security and uh, development. Um, uh, the least, latest data that I can find, uh, I can find is uh, um, data for 2019 that there were uh, 4.95 million, so just close to 5 million deaths that could be associated with uh, uh, um, anti antibiotics resistance, including 1.27 million that could be actually attributed uh, to uh, bacterial uh, anti uh, antimicrobial resistance. So I don't need to. Uh, uh, further convince you about the importance of uh, anti antibiotics resistance. Um, the, uh, the, interest, the, the important part is that uh, uh, the anti uh, antibiotics resistance uh, um, is also uh, connect, closely connected to the agriculture sector because antibiotics is widely used in, um, in the agriculture sector to treat, control, and prevent diseases. It's just livestock, like uh, livestock are just like a, a, a human being. Livestock animals are just like human being. You know, uh, prevention um, of disease, uh, treatment of disease is very important. Uh, the statistics that I can find here says that eighty percent of antibiotics are consumed in livestock production. While I was uh, uh, preparing for this talk, I went to check for the numbers in um, at the FGA website. I actually got a further education. Uh, we need to be very careful about comparing numbers like this, uh, uh, just because um, that there are uh, way more animals. Think about chickens, hogs, and uh, beef cattle, cows, etc., uh, than human beings. So uh, also uh, animals use a different portfolio of antibiotics. So when we see numbers like this, we want to be careful. But the point is still here: um, antibiotics use in agriculture uh, is very important uh, for uh, for the, um, the management of antibiotics resistance. Um, different uh, uh, go um, uh, governments, especially governments in developed countries, uh, have been um, trying to have implemented policies to try to improve uh, antibiotics use. Um, an important example would be the VFD, the Veterinary Feed, uh, Feed Directive. Uh, basically, what this one says is that uh, the antibiotics that is used in uh, animal feed has to be under the uh, has to be used under the supervision of a veterinarian. Um, the judicious uh, antibiotics use is uh, has been promoted by uh, government agencies. So for judicious uh, use of antibiotics, basically that means you know proper timing, proper dosage, proper uh, duration for all such information that uh, the expertise, the experts would be the uh, veterinarians. So, so lots of responsibility is put in the hands of veterinarians for the judicious use of, of antibiotics. For our research, we focus on how um, uh, doctors, uh, animal doctors, um, uh, update their information uh, when making their diagnostic uh, decisions. We also examine how the, uh, um, animal doctors make uh, treatment decisions. Sometimes I say animal doctors or just doctors, because I think most of our research can be easily applied to humans and me. Uh, but our research and our application and our um, our experimental participants are all uh, veterinarians. So the contribution of the paper, I'm just going to be very brief. Uh, as far as the information update is concerned, there's a very large literature about how people um, update information. So for uh, one of our contribution is that uh, we examine uh, information update uh, with a novel uh, and a very important professional group, which is, uh, which is the veterinarians. Um, and I don't, uh, 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 I'm not aware, you know, any other similar studies that uh, has been, uh, that have been done um, with uh, experiments on veterinarians uh, about uh, uh, the issues that we examine here. We also disentangle uh, biases due to inefficient use of acquires and the bias is due to the insufficient use of new information in, in uh, actual clinical settings. Uh, I'll explain more about these two biases. We uh, uh, also investigate uh, both diagnostic decisions and treatment decisions, and our experiments are incentivized. So these are the uh, contributions of our research. 
there are uh, basically uh, three steps uh, when thinking about uh, uh, disease management, uh, you know, treatment of a potential uh, case of disease. Um, so when a vet doctor is called um, to see uh, a suspect uh, um, sick animal to see what's going on with, with an animal, the first step that the doctor will do is to make diagnostic decisions. So basically, you know, what's the probability that uh, uh, an animal actually has a, a disease in question? And the doctor will do this by gathering all information and obviously will make a diagnostic decisions also in um, combination with the, the doctor's own knowledge and experience. And then after that, the doctor has to make a decision about what to do with the case. You know, if a farmer calls a doctor or if a pet owner calls a doctor, they want to, uh, the, the, uh, the owners will say, so what do I do? So the doctor will assess the costs and the benefits of possible treatment alternatives. There are different types of costs and different benefits uh, besides just, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the animal gets better or the, the, the cost of the medicine in the farm animal case, like suppose in the case of the cow, you have to think about uh, you know the, uh, the the milk production. There will be a withdrawal withdraw period, meaning you know the cow the milk cannot be used immediately when after the antibiotics is administ administered with the cow. There has to be some waiting period, and in that period the, the, the milk has to be discarded. So in treatment decisions like this, uh, the doctor will have to consider uh, such a uh, trade off. The other one would be um, private costs and benefits versus the social benefits and costs. So how much uh, a doctor should consider antibiotic resistance in the decision making? Uh, assuming you know we, when uh, a farmer calls a doctor, the farmer wants the wants its animals to get better or to you know to maximize profits. Or some farmers do care about the antibiotic resistance. Maybe the doctor will have a, a broader concerns. So our uh, pet doctors. So um, the, 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 the last decision obviously is to, so there are benefits and the costs, the doctor will have to weigh the benefits and costs and come to a treatment decision. All of these three steps can involve biases. Uh, the first step would be, you know, bias belief updating about uh, how likely the, the animal uh, in question is sick and the different doctors may come to different diagnostic decisions based on their experience and based on the way, you know, the process information, which is very important. And uh, that's an important question we examine in our research. Um, the second step would be that the doctor may fail to assess the benefits and costs associated with antibiotic use. Again, you know, it's, it's tricky about uh, uh, what factors should be considered and what's the objective function, etc. And um, the last one would be that, uh, you know, uh, given all information, a doctor uh, may uh, choose a treatment. Uh, maybe that's not best for all, maybe not best for farmers, uh, depending on the doctor's preference. The first uh, bias is, uh, the first bias is, uh, the first type of bias is, uh, is the focus of our research was always to consider treatment uh, decisions. Um, as I said, there's a very large literature on, on uh, information updating. So the, the standard and the most commonly used rule of information updating would be the, the base theory. So the base theory investigates a formula that will, uh, that incorporates uh, uh, prior beliefs as well as new information and the formula will give uh, uh, a, a posterior, uh, you know, a post test, a post new information a probability. Uh, specifically consider our, our, our setting of research, consider a doctor who is evaluating the likelihood that an animal is sick and uh, the doctor can use the assistance of a diagnostic test. The important question here is that the diagnostic test is not 100% accurate. And obviously if the test is 100% accurate, then there's no uncertainty, then the doctor should make the diagnostic decision just based on the test. Um, so there are three pieces of information that are important uh, in the discussion of information updating. One is priors. So priors are formed based on um, uh, knowledge, uh, experience, and uh, observations. So in the case of, uh, um, uh, of, uh, of a doctor seeing a cow, so the, the doctor would uh, uh, make that, uh, would, uh, would have some prior 
probability um, about how likely is the cow is sick with the disease uh, based on you know, the, the doctor's experience of seeing other cows about uh, observing what's going on with the farm the cow is in and examining uh, if the cow's uh, health history and the doctor can form uh, a probability like the likelihood that the cow is sick. Um, then if the doctor orders a test, the, the test results can be positive or can be negative, and the doctor can um, um, process or can incorporate this new information into the prior and come to a posterior probability. So the posterior probability, depending on the prior and the test result, and the most important of all, how doctors, how decision makers combine the two together. And because of the process can be affected by many factors. And it's well known that there can be biases or deviations from a basin posterior. So here's one illustration about a conservative posterior. So the red line uh, is uh, um, starting from, let, let me take a step back. The prior uh, PD is the starting, uh, is the starting probability. Um, so the, the doctor has a prior brief that uh, uh, an animal is sick with probability PD. And then the doctor orders a test, test result comes back as positive. The red line indicates a base posterior update. So it should be higher than the, the black line, which would be the prior because the test is positive. So by the way, we assume that test accuracy is somewhat useful. If, uh, if, if the cow is sick with the disease, it, it should have more than 50% chance of, uh, of uh, being tested positive. Or similarly, if the cow does, uh, if the animal, the cow does not have the disease, then uh, the animal should test, uh, should have a 50% chance of testing not uh, positive or negative. Otherwise, the test is useless. So the test is somewhat useful. And then anywhere between the red, between the red line and the black line can be a, a conservative posterior. So basically, the doctor does not update as much as base uh, serum predicts. So we call this conservative or under inference. Uh, similarly, giving a negative Giving a negative test result, so the doctor has the same prior, but then the test comes back as negative. Again, the doctor updates uh, its belief based on the new information. Base theory said the doctor really should go to the red, or the red arrow is, uh, but the doctor could say uh, the actually the, the posterior uh, probability that's formed may be the purple line. So it's not as much as the red line. So both in these two cases, that the doctor does not update as much as base and theory uh, predict. So basically they hold on to their prior, they probably have, uh, um, the, uh, have very strong confidence in their prior and have, on the other hand has, uh, have less confidence in the test. So that's uh, under inference uh, given test result. And there are other um, types of, uh, of biases too. So in this case, this graph looks pre pretty much like the first one I showed, except maybe it can be caused by different reason. Uh, so for this one, we say the prior probability is greater than 50%. That is the cow is very much likely uh, to, be, uh, to be sick with the disease D and then the test results comes back as positive. So the Bayesian theory predicts that, uh, hey, you know, um, the probability the cow is sick should be much higher than you know than the black line that which would be the prior. But then some doctors may still say, well, I think the probability is somewhere along the purple line. So this is again under insurance, but it's uh, it's for dif uh, under inference, but it's for different reason. So in this case, it, it could be caused by the doctor's uh, uh, neglect or or, or um, not taken full into account the prior that, you know, remember the cow is likely to be sick. So that's under inference with what we call base rate, uh, base rate neglect posterior. Um, base rate neglect, uh, neglect posterior can have another uh, um, type of manifest when the test comes out as negative. So the, the, the base posterior said, that, again, indicates that it should be somewhere the, where the red arrow points. But the doctor, instead, uh, uh, assuming that the animal is more likely to be sick, 
uh, uh, is less likely to have the disease. That's the other way to say it, uh, because uh, the doctor probably didn't take, that does not take full into account the prior that uh, remember this is the cow that uh, you know given the health history given the uh, given the neighborhood condition probably you know if the cow has not been a good uh, condition for a while and also there's this disease going on in the neighborhood uh, given all such prior information um, that uh, uh, the the base posterior indicates you know the um, it's it's more likely the cow uh, is sick than what a doctor would uh, uh, would think. So that that uh, again, that's another manifestation of base rate neglect uh, posterior. So so far, I just presented the four types of uh, biases. Um, so one would be uh, maybe basically two, but depending on the test results. So there are four yellow highlighted areas. We design experiments. Uh, to test whether there are such biases and estimate the, uh, the extent of biases. So um, we can formalize this, this. Remember that I mentioned there are three key factors. One is the prior. Uh, so the initial belief probably they have a disease. The second one is new information. Formally, you know, it's tested as positive and negative. And then it's also very important to the likelihood of the observing test results. So, so how accurate the test is, uh, you know, if the probability that, that you will actually get a positive test uh, when, the, uh, when, the, when the animal is sick and the probability you will actually get some test result when the animal is not sick. And, uh, the base theorem, as I said, it's just a formula. It puts all the information piece together. And uh, 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 given reasonable assumptions, you know about the, the usefulness of the test. Um, testing positive should usually uh, should push up the probability that uh, uh, an animal is sick with disease D, and testing negative will push the downward the animal is sick with disease D. And going with, with this type uh, of uh, formula, we can formally derive uh, an estimation equation that looks like this. So basically, the um, the left hand side is odds is the odds of the of an animal having the disease given testing information, and there's a similar term on the right, um, except there's no conditional uh, conditional term. So it's just the the odds that. Uh, the animal is sick with disease D without testing information. So we call this right turn and as a, a prior uh, prior art, and the one on the left it calls posterior art. The middle one uh, here is the likelihood ratio of testing result I. Remember I can be positive and negative. So with an equation like this, um, we can test the coefficient of C and D, the size and the sign. The base and theory uh, inference would imply that uh, both, so not just one of them, both C and D here on the table, both C and D needs to be equal to one uh, in order for the inference to be, um, to be uh, uh, base theory and updating consistent. Otherwise, uh, we'll have uh, biases. So if D is less than one, the first row, if D is less than one, remember D is here. So D is the way you may interpret this as weight on uh, um, the prior art. So basically, if D is less than one, we say it's base rate neglect, meaning less, uh, less weight is putting on prior art. When we say less or more, the benchmark is the basin in basin theory. So basically, base rate neglect means that uh, the decision maker in this case, uh, veterinarians or doctors, uh, put put uh, less weight on the prior art. So that's d less than one, and then the opposite would be degree uh, greater than one. Then that would be the base rate overuse. Similarly, for the likelihood ratio, um, there can be under, inf uh, under inference or over inference. If C is less than one, that means the doctor puts less weight that, uh, you know, when uh, the doctor, when if uh, an animal is sick, that how likely the, the animal will test a positive or negative relative when the, cow, uh, when the animal is not sick. So this would be the, um, you may see the, 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 uh, the conceptual framework that we use to set up our empirical testing with experiments. Um, 
uh, not just uh, uh, simply testing whether CMD is equal to one, but also try to uh, identify uh, or, or test uh, whether two contextual uh, factors will affect uh, the posterior um, the, uh, the, the posterior uh, the posterior arts. So one of them is the confirmatory biases. By confirm and not confirm um, the prior, I mean that um, uh, I, I mean in this sense. For example, if the doctor thinks that um, the prior, if the prior belief, what the doctor think is that um, the, the animal is has a fifty has over fifty percent chance of being sick with disease D, then we say you know it's likely to have the disease, and if the test comes out as a positive, then we say the test confirms the doctor's prior. So it's consistent. The doctor believes that the cow is likely to be sick. Hey, the test result comes out saying it's, uh, it's actually positive. So it's, uh, that's a confirmed prior. On the other hand, you know, if the doctor believes uh, the cow um, is likely to be sick, like with 80%, 80%, 90% chance that the cow is likely to be sick, then um, if the test result uh, comes out as negative, then we say in this case, the test result disconfirms the doctor's prior. Um, there's some literature that, that says that uh, depending on uh, whether the evidence confirms or, or disconfirms uh, a, doc, uh, a prior, the response may be different. So here, the now would be responsive to new information that is consistent with the priors uh, as the same uh, as, 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 as the same as response to new information that contrasts the priors. So it depending, that's the size of delta C1, whether delta C1 is equal to zero or not. And uh, uh, we, uh, we, we conjecture that this delta C1 probably is positive. So that's one contextual factor that uh, uh, we test. Um, the uh, other contextual factor we test is about uh, preference bias to inference. As uh, everybody likes good news, you know, if we think that's good news, maybe we will be more responsive. Uh, if it's bad news, we not we are not so responsive. So in this case, uh, we may say that uh, a negative uh, test result uh, is uh, is a piece of good news uh, that uh, a doctor may may respond more to that than if the test is negative. So these are some of the uh, these are two contextual factors that we test uh, based on what we learned from from the literature about uh, information updating. Um, we also um, model treatment decisions. So we, we assume that uh, the doctor has some um, objective function that they try to maximize, uh, which would be affected by different factors, costs, benefits, and uh, uh, important for our research uncertainties. And we hypothesize or we conjecture that um, uncertainties will affect our doctor's treatment decisions. So that's our conceptual framework. In terms of uh, survey experiment design, we have two sections, uh, one for diagnostic decision and the other for treatment decision. For the diagnostic decision, we have four sections. So, um, no, uh, sorry, uh, the, 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 survey, uh, the survey experiment itself has, uh, has four sections. And the first section is diagnostic decisions. Sorry for, mis, um, uh, for misspeaking. Um, then for this one, each participant uh, will, um, will answer questions uh, for different scenarios uh, um, uh, with different information about the priors and test information. And we ask them uh, what's, what's their posterior belief. In section B, we ask about the treatment decisions uh, given different information. Section B is set up as a choice experiment. Then we, uh, uh, in section C, in the third section, we ask uh, uh, the participants their views about uh, uh, the decision making, like uh, test reliability and their views of antibiotic resistance and animal welfare perspectives, etc. Uh, for the last section, we collect the basic demographic information. So our experiments are uh, incentivized. We pay thirty dollars of uh, completion uh, payment. Uh, with a, a chance of winning um, additional $30, it's based on their answers. 
to give you a sense about uh, uh, the uh, experimental questions, give you one uh, example question here. So this is the uh, this is one example question uh, related to diagnostic decisions. So we do have the chip talk. We are we ask him to take each scenario as a real world situation. And we ask them also to make uh, sure their answers make common sense. For example, you know, positive test result would suggest higher likelihood of disease occurring, etc. There are four pieces of information we provide. Uh, we uh, we provide each participant in the question. So seventy out of for, this is just one example. We vary the numbers uh, for. Uh, we have different scenarios. So for this one, we say the prevalence rates as the prior are 70 out of every 100 cows have disease. And uh, the test result in this case is positive. Uh, we have other scenario, scenarios asking for, uh, other question asking for negative. And then we give them the false positive rate and the false negative rate. So the false positive obviously is that the cow does not have the disease by testing positive. And uh, for the false negative, the cow has disease, but uh, uh, testing negative. And the, the way we ask the question is asking to place the bar where they think it should be. Okay. So that's an example question of diagnostic decisions. So for this one, we have uh, uh, 40 diagnostic cases. Uh, which are different in three parameters, prevalence rate, test result, and false positive rate. Um, and then these are the levels we chose for each of these uh, uh, three factors. And so we vary, uh, we, we vary these factors. And, and in total, we have 40 cases. Um, and if we ask 40 questions of each participant, they surely would be tired and the questions wouldn't be so reliable. So we uh, divided the 40 questions into four blocks and each participant is only asked the 10 diagnostic uh, cases. So that's uh, for section A, diagnostic decisions. And this is one example question of, uh, um, of the experiment about the treatment decisions. So we give the information about uh, uh, how likely, you know, the, the, how likely the cow uh, has uh, has an infection. In this case, it's mastitis. Uh, so we um, we design the questions in a uh, in a clinic set in a clinic setting that's set for the for the veterinarian doctor. So we ask them, you know, whether you see farm animals like big animals or you see small animals. We give them different examples. For you know, for farm animals, we ask about mastitis, and for uh, for for pet doctors, we ask a, a question that's more relevant uh, for uh, uh, for a pet setting. So the, these are the factors so we we um, attributes in our choice experiments. So treatment cost, uh, a potential to increase antibiotic resistance, and we, uh, there's cure rate of mastitis. Uh, you know uh, how likely the treatment uh, will be effective. And also, we ask about uh, uh, the the animal welfare improvement and uh, uh, the the economic benefits. Basically, it's loss avoided. Um, so, as uh, you recognize the potential to increase antibiotic resistance and animal welfare, especially the antibiotic resistance, that be more social uh, social impacts related. That has less direct impact uh, on the uh, on, on the animal or the the farm that's being concerned. So that's uh, uh, one example question uh, from treatment decisions. Again, we have uh, um, uh, different scenarios and we only ask uh, six, six questions uh, of each participant. So we have the block design to try to uh, maximize uh, the, uh, the estimation efficiency. So that's uh, uh, um, the questions. For the experiment, so it's implemented in November to December 2020. So it's the, in the in the depths of the pandemic. So the survey is uh, uh, implemented with the online platform, the Cortex. Uh, so we call it survey experiment. And uh, we have uh, uh, one uh, the veterinarian uh, in, uh, on our team. So he has been, he was very helpful in terms of reaching out to different uh, uh, doctors associations. Then let me just say it that way. They have different names. As you can see here, one of them is American Association of Bovine Practitioners. So we try to reach out to different uh, uh, associations and to treat groups. Uh, before that, uh, the, uh, the questionnaires are extensively tested uh, with some um, uh, with with uh, with veterinary with upper level veterinary graduate students, 
So in total, we received 241 complete, uh, com complete and qualified uh, responses. And uh, we, we targeted about half half, so it's 119 responses uh, to the large animal disease. So it's more like in the farm environment and 122 are responses to the small animal disease management. So we have different versions as I mentioned. So that's, uh, I think that's about uh, a question design and uh, a survey experiment implementation. And so these are, I, uh, these are the factors, uh, I think um, I talk about this, uh, about the, diff the, the levels of different attributes. Uh, um, so this is the uh, demographics of, of the respondents. So we asked about age, working experience, and gender, and their views of uh, animal welfare, uh, you know, the, how important uh, they think um, um, what animal welfare is in their animal care decision making. We also ask about uh, acceptance of antibiotics use. So um, there are some differences uh, in terms of work experience and in terms of uh, acceptance of antibiotics usage in these two groups. Uh, it's quite large actually. So large animals, they think that only 65% of large animal vets think, uh, you know, it's no, the, the, the average is, or so sorry, it's the average of the points. It's only 65 and um, uh, the, for, the, for the small animal vets, it's 81%. So it looks like that um, um, small animal vets think it's more acceptable uh, for you to use antibiotics than large animal vets. So we, we do run our tests and our regression uh, based on different uh, um, control variables. Um, but I'm just, uh, and we run quite a bit of them just to see, you know, which are um, uh, important in decision making that may be important for, for policy targeting. But I'm just going to show you some of the modeling results. So the, uh, the this is uh, um, um, some of the, our main results regarding diagnostic decision making and uh, biased uh, information update. So uh, this is uh, about quite the, the red numbers are prior odds and the coefficient of uh, um, uh, prior odds and um, the, 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 the green numbers are the coefficient for the likelihood ratio. So if you remember, if you don't, that's okay. The, the base theorem um, uh, requires, uh, if it requires that these coefficients uh, to be uh, to be close to one. So I've, I'm, I'm showing you here three models, uh, depending on which variables are included in the, uh, in, the, in the regression, they show actually very similar results. The, the, the clear um, um, observation is that all these numbers are significantly less than one. And um, the prior odds numbers are much smaller than the likelihood ratio. We compared these numbers to, um, to, the, to the findings in the literature, which are mostly based on lab experiments. So ours would be framed, uh, fr framed experiments you know, in the clinic setting. So it's, uh, but still our numbers are quite consistent uh, with the findings in the literature. So it's under, in under inference, under use of the information in terms of a prior odds. So that would be, um, um, so that that, uh, that that would be the, the base uh, uh, that, that, that would be the base rate related information and then the likelihood ratio the, how much they use the test information. So in both cases uh, we found that the, the doctors, the veterinarians uh, didn't uh, use as much as what a base theory uh, pre predicts they should. And I um, don't think I'm going to get into the, the other two control variables in terms of the extreme posterior SPT. Uh, so we also test the two um, contextual factors that I mentioned. The one is about uh, uh, confirmation uh, bias related uh, um, biases, biases, and the other is related about uh, preference based um, uh, biases. The first one is test result is uh, confirming. So as I said, if you think the animal is more likely uh, to be sick and then hey, you got a positive uh, result, then that type of a test result uh, will uh, likely um, uh, increase. Uh, it will, will likely increase the role of uh, log likelihood ratio, the, the role of log uh, of likelihood ratio, although it's not very significant, you see it's only one star. And we didn't find significance uh, in terms of uh, the, the good news, uh, the impact of, 
of good news related buyers, preference related buyers. So as I said, uh, in our setting, actually, it's not very clear about uh, what good news means in our, in our setting. So it's not uh, surprising that uh, this is not significant. Um, so we, uh, we, as I said, we also did other um, tests to see, the to see the heterogeneity among different groups and also to see whether, you know, how demographic factors and how we use may have played a role, but I don't think I'm gonna get into that. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly go over the treatment decision um, results based on the uh, based on survey, based on experimental responses. So we, um, we uh, asked the information we used uh, uh, we incorporated these six factors uh, in the decision making our choice experiment uh, the treatment cost, uh, economic loss avoided. So, that, as I say, that's just the benefits of treatment uh, cure rate and uh, diagnostic uncertainty. We classify them as uh, we divide them into you know, high uncertainty category, medium uncertainty category, and also the potential to increase antibiotic resistance. Uh, in terms of a low or high or zero. So zero would be, you know, there's nothing, there's no impact on antibiotic resistance. Uh, that would be our, our, our baseline uh, benchmark group. And also we uh, asked about, uh, uh, you know, the, the role of uh, animal welfare improvement uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the treatment decision making. So these are the six factors we consider in our treatment decision uh, experiment. So, <clears throat> Our results, so it's a very long table. Um, the main factors uh, are all found to be significant with expected signs that um, we use mixed logic uh, modeling uh, for treatment decision making. So the treatment costs and the medical resistance cure rate and avoided costs all play significant roles, uh, as I said, in their expected uh, signs. So, for example, you know, treatment costs, uh, as treatment costs increases. Uh, uh, a doctor is less likely to choose a treatment option. So that's not uh, unexpected. The, uh, the one thing that I want to draw your attention is that we found that diagnostic uncertainty will reduce the willingness to treat. So uh, high uncertainty means, means that, uh, you know, the, uh, as I showed in the previous slide, the doctor thinks that, uh, you know, the, the likelihood the animal has, uh, the animal has the disease is only is less than 30%. And for the median uncertainty, the, the, the likelihood that the animal has a disease is about 30 to, uh, to 60%. So uncertainty will, uh, will have uh, an impact on the marginal effects of treatment costs and of cure rate and uh, of, um, of the expected benefit, which is the economic loss avoided. So this means it's, uh, it's very important how uh, we um, help doctor you know, at, in, at the policy level, you know, how, we, how, how we can help the medical professionals uh, in terms of their, uh, their treatment, their diagnostic decision making, because uncertainty does play a role. You know, if it's just uncertain, yeah, it's true, you know, you can't, uh, if, if, the, if the animal is only about, uh, uh, is less than 30, has only has about less than 30 percent chance of, of, ha of having the disease D, and if that's confirmed, you know, with, with tests, you just can't make sure, then in that case, you know, the doctor will be less likely to treat, and um, that's uh, maybe it's, it's a good thing, you know, there's no point if, uh, if you're not so sure, and uh, that, that would be uh, good for social efficiency. So that's um, uh, that, that's the uh, uh, empirical results regarding uh, treatment uh, decision making. I, you know, again, as I said, we, we run different uh, models and uh, try to see the impacts of different variables too. But this this is one of the result tables. So uh, uh, to conclude that. Uh, um, so vets or doctors are usually not certain when making diagnosis a diagnosis of a disease. And so all they have to do is make a probability, probabilistic assessment of disease. And, um, and it's very important um, to understand how veterinarians or, or you know, medical professionals make their diagnos diagnosis um, decisions. And uh, what we have found is that uh, there are significant biases, um, both in terms of the base rate uh, neglect bias and uh, uh, based on the uh, based on the uh, the information updating um, bias. So um, 
what's really important is that uh, you saw that the average experience and it's, it's it's doctors with as many years of experience so it's not like uh, that uh, if uh, uh, a veterinarian doctor is more in, uh, experienced, you know, since they're experienced, they will have less bias. So the biases exist among experienced professionals. So this uh, implies uh, that uh, in order for doctors to come up with, uh, you know, efficient diagnostic decision and treatment decisions, uh, it's probably very important uh, to, um, to have uh, um, education or outreach uh, type of um, activities uh, to so that the experienced professionals are uh, more aware of the biases that uh, are likely to happen in their uh, diagnostic and treatment decision making. Um, that concludes uh, my seminar and I'll answer questions. I haven't uh, taken a look at any questions in the chat. Yeah, thank, thank you, Hongli. I very much appreciate that. Uh, really fascinating uh, presentation and uh, appreciate you being here with us today. And uh, we do have some, uh, some questions in the chat. Uh, we'll, we'll work through those and um, we, we, have some, we have some coming in now, as a matter of fact. So we'll, we'll start uh, with just, a, I guess, a, a couple of clarification questions about um, the, the overall survey. So, so Laura had put out a, and Laura, or I'm sorry, Hongli, if we can go back to the um, conclusions, there's a there's a question coming that might refer back to those. Yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of the recruiting, uh, you know, Laura noted recruiting professionals is sometimes pretty difficult. Uh, I'm curious about the strategies that you use to get get those folks recruited and your overall response rate. Can you speak to that? Um. So, so there are two separate questions. So one is about the recruitment strategy, the other is about uh, a response rate. So the, the first one is uh, we, we were fully aware of that when, started, when we started doing this. We are uh, targeting veterinarians. So from the, uh, from the very beginning, we have involved the veterinarian professionals in terms of a question design, in terms of outreach. Um, so I hope that helps. As I said, it, it, we, we, tend to, we turn to him for, um, um, for, for pilot testing. For example, he, he, teaches, uh, uh, he, he teaches upper level students. He also, uh, he also has, uh, has professionally come back for, uh, you know, for continuous education. So that's why we start, I mean, obviously he, he, he is a veterinary doctor and he is in this area. So uh, that has been really helpful. And we got a list of, uh, of the associations that just, uh, they shared their, our, their email addresses with us, their contact information with us. So we wouldn't be able to get that uh, otherwise. Um, the second question is tougher. Um, it's uh, um, the, the short answer is no, or we cannot calculate uh, um, an, a response rate. I think this is, uh, this is not unique to our study uh, of, uh, uh, of, of, online, uh, of online research like ours. And so um, yeah, we, uh, we just uh, um, emailed and uh, reached out to the associations and uh, um, we actually also um, reached out to Danata, so for to reach out to to, to uh, recruit participants. Um, uh, I we, I uh, I don't know how many opened our emails, and I don't know yeah. how how to calculate. But I think this is a very common situation in online experiments like this. Sure. Um, so we we had a had a question about just you know define good news. So does that mean that the animal is healthy? Uh, and that's going to lead into a, a follow-up question about about the veterinarians. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, as I said, I think we were uh, we thought there may be something there. As I said, it's just uh, we check uh, as uh, the the test. Uh, you know, we didn't reject it now that it didn't make a difference. As I said, uh, it's very different from uh, in our case. You know, like a like a human. A human patient is sick, or you know, like in the stock market, whether you have the good news is very obvious. It just, you increase your return, or you're not sick. But in this animal's case, I'm not quite sure. And also, this is not the owner. We're asking the doctor. So the doctor is the third party. You know, the doctor is there. Yeah their mission is just to cure. Um, so it's not like the owner. So that's why maybe we didn't find a significant, uh, a didn't significant result. The good news, uh, uh, to clarify, the good news is if the test is negative. 
Yeah. Meaning that the, the, the animal is, is, is it does not, the test shows that the animal does not have the disease. Yeah, so, and you, you touched on where I was headed next. Um, you know, so, so you're dealing with the, with the veterinarians and we had a, a couple of questions that very similar in nature. You know, we're, we're assuming these are, you know, altruistic folks um, and they, you know, they have uh, the, best, the best for their uh, client and the, and the patient uh, at, at heart here. But, you know, a lot of them also sell the medications. So, you know, were you able to account for you know, how, how did you, if at all, account for, you know, how that might have, have impacted the results of, of the veterinarians also providing the, you know, the antibiotics, the treatment, um, and their idea of increasing their profits? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. And I don't think, uh, uh, I think it's asking about uh, the doctors probably care about the relationship. When they make decisions, so they have two objectives. Obviously, they want to make sure that the, the, uh, their mission, this, this sworn in to care the animal. Uh, but the, obviously, they're business people. They're all entrepreneurs. And that we, we, had, um, we had a survey about two years ago. We did ask about that, how important uh, the client relationship is for you. Uh, but we, I don't think we ask that in this, but that's a very, uh, very good question that, uh, you know, it's like, this is, a, this is a huge issue in human medicine use. Uh, doctors are under pressure to prescribe uh, uh, antibiotics because uh, your patients will, can't go home empty handed. Right. It, yeah. And so the, the reason I, I wanted to have you leave the uh, concluding remarks slide up, we had a very, very specific question uh, about, looks like it's the fourth bullet down, um, found significant biases and utilization of both testing and prior belief. And so there was a, a question in the chat, uh, and it was on one of the earlier slides, uh, I think that Dan was referring to, did the vets underuse both the prior and test results? Yes. So if you remember my slide, my slide has a C and a D. That's why we have, that's how we separate them. And uh, uh, C is about 0.4-ish uh, and uh, D is about 0.7-ish. So um, the well based basin theory requires them to be both, uh, to be uh, equal to one. So we did find uh, the both. So I think it's quite common, even in the context of COVID, you know, when people talk about the probability of getting sick and, you know, we need to talk about which population are we talking about? And what's, what's, what's the base rate? Are you talking about those more likely, to, you know, those who have gone for tests, you know, et cetera. So it's very important, I think, to remind, to, for doctors, yeah, as I say, even for professionals uh, to be really, they need to remind themselves or reminded by others that there's base rate and that there is test. Um, the, the, the key here is that the test is not accurate. So I mean, obviously, you know, it's, if test is more accurate, it will, be, it will help too. But the more accurate test tends to be more expensive. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. so I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm bound to follow up. So so Dan Dan writes. Well, if they're only using both, what are they using to make decisions? Uh, pardon. Uh, so the, the follow up question: If if they are underusing both of these, yeah. what are they using to make their decisions? Wow, that's a great question. So yeah. Um, and so. Uh, in the very simplest regression, is that done? Oh, that's a tough question. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. from me. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's Dan causing trouble, but it's, uh, it's always, good. always good trouble. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a great question, and I think we definitely will take that into account in our in our further investigation of the issue. So, in terms of regression, so what I can say is that uh, there are some control factors. So we, we we can we can see a little bit, you know, how they're be used. For example, we ask the VUs uh, may come into play, uh, but obviously, there's always a great intercept. So it's uh, <laughs> so it's 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 a bit probably being lumped into the into the intercept, and what we identify is the marginal effect of those uh, of those two factors. So, so we are so this question, the research question, is less about uh, explaining how the posterior is formed. We are not as economists, we are not capable of doing that. You know, I tell my graduate students, uh, I we can't answer that question: how posterior is formed and which factors play it. However, we can test just these particular two factors: base rate and you know the testing information, just to see 
exactly how uh, these two factors play a role or not playing a role. And the others are either being controlled as fixed effects or as in other control variables. That's because we have a limited knowledge of the issue. So, um, you know, this, uh, yeah, so that's, I hope that's, then we can talk more about it, but it's great. We, we, in, uh, in, that's just in terms of a regression results, but we will definitely investigate that, investigate that question. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I appreciate that. And so we're, uh, I know we're, we're running a little short of time. I was just gonna take a bit of personal privilege. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually a beef cattle producer and my brother is a vet. And so I was you know, keenly <laughs> interested in all of this. Um, and, and so the question I had, and someone actually put it in the chat too, you, sh you showed some demographics of your, of your respondents, large animal and small animal. Did, did you look at, by chance, beef, cattle versus dairy? Um, but, because I'm, I'm curious, and, and again, uh, and I, I can't remember who put it in the chat, but a similar question, you know, that one might tend to be treated slightly differently uh, in, in terms of, you know, milk production versus, versus beef. I wonder if you know, if you've looked at any of that, and, and if not, you know, maybe some plans to dig further into the demographic information. Um, I'm not sure, but it, again, this is a great question. So we, our research really started with dairy. So we have, a, uh, we have quite a piece of the related research regarding dairy and mastitis management. Uh, yeah, that, was, yeah. that was mostly what's in our mind. So I believe we targeted also, uh, um, also dairy, but I think as you, as you said, we, uh, you know, in our, some of the associations we did send to other, uh, but I, 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 on top of my head, I don't know whether that's in the regression or not, but I can get back to you. But Mark, you just identified yourself as a very useful potential participant. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, we, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll forward your email on to my brother. How about that? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, I, it's, yeah. It's great. This is, this is, uh, this is all really fascinating, but. Um, yeah, so Hong Lee, um, we, we are running short of time. We're, we've got about a minute to go. If you could uh, stop your share, I think Laura's got um, Laura's got something to put up and wrap up. Yeah, uh, I see see the applause, Laura. Thank you, um, Hong. I really really appreciate your time. This was a good good session. We had a lot of participants and a lot of good discussion. Um, I know there were some some other questions in the chat comments. We will make we will absolutely capture all of those and and maybe circle them back to Hong Lee and you know get get some answers out. Um, appreciate the participation today and um, all of you being with us. One final reminder: we have the last in this year uh, year's seminar series on April the fourth uh, with Dr. Kent Messer. So please plan to join us then. Uh, and with that, Laura, any final <laughs> announcements? Really? Nope, that, that's all. Thank you so much, Hong Lee. That was awesome. Yeah, fantastic. And we are right. right at 12 and we will we will adjourn with uh with our thanks. But have Thank a good day. Thank you everybody. so much. Take care, everyone.